Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and for our Halloween treat this year, I wanted to look at one of the all-time classics of the genre, Frankenstein, released in 1931 by Universal Studios and directed by James Whale. Adapted from a play based on the 1818 novel by Mary Shelley, not Mrs. Percy B. Shelley opening credits of this movie, Frankenstein is one of the best-known horror stories of all time. Although this was not the first film adaptation of the Frankenstein story, it's by far the most famous, and the one that forever shaped how we think of Frankenstein's mind monster, who, yes, is often simply called Frankenstein. And you know what? It's not that big a deal. It's fine. Played by Boris Karloff, with makeup designed by Jack Pierce, this is your father's Frankenstein. This version of the monster has been replicated and parodied non-stop for the past 90 years. Think about that. You'd be hard-pressed to find anyone who doesn't know what Frankenstein's monster looks like, and it's been nearly a century since this movie came out. That is one hell of a legacy. The history of Frankenstein is worth countless hours of discussion, but since this is a comedy show on YouTube that's ostensibly about counting kills, I think we should just cut to the chase and get to them already. The movie begins with OG Van Helsing, Edward Van Sloan, also this movie's Dr. Waldman, giving a word of friendly warning to the audience. I think it will thrill you. It may shock you. It might even horrify you. If this looks familiar, it's because The Simpsons parodied this opening in their first few Treehouse of Horror episodes. So if you have sensitive children, maybe you should tuck them into bed early tonight instead of writing us angry letters tomorrow. The short opening credits feature a kaleidoscope of eyes and a big old question mark for the monster's performer. Though I'll give you a hint, his name rhymes with Shmora Shmarloff. A bunch of people are gathered at a gravesite burial in a cemetery with a giant fake sky background. After the dirt is shoveled in and the last well-wisher leaves, Dr. Henry Frankenstein and his platonic life partner Fritz slink their way to the gravesite and get straight to work. Ooh, this doctor ain't afraid to roll up his sleeves and work right alongside his hunchback toady. I like that. They successfully dig up the coffin, and Frankenstein can't wait to take his new toy home and play with it. He's just resting waiting for a new life to come. But Frankenstein's not satisfied with just a single new addition to his collection. He wants a whole set, so he and Fritz gather up another body, that of a recently hanged criminal. I guess I'll put this body on the count, since I counted similarly discovered bodies in the Adrian Brody Predators movie. But I won't count the one they dug up, since we never saw it. I don't know, man. It doesn't matter. Unfortunately for Frankenstein, this latest body's not in NRFB condition. The neck's broken. The brain is useless. We must find another brain. Hey, you can't get that mad, dude. The listing for that dead body said good condition. You know you should have paid extra for the one that said like new. To get a new brain, Fritz peeps in on a medical college class straight out of the Nick, where the professor, Dr. Waldman, gives his class a cut comparison on the two brain specimens they have. One in absolutely perfect condition, and the other a big dumb duty brain that came from a degenerate criminal. I'll give you two guesses as to which one Fritz winds up with after class is dismissed. To his credit, he does go for gold at first, but then old Butterfinger Fritz drops and breaks that brain, so he's forced to settle for the convict cortex. Frankenstein sends a letter to his fiancée Elizabeth, who you can tell is his fiancée because she keeps a picture of him on the piano. The letter says that Frankenstein is in a watchtower working on experiments, and that concerns Elizabeth enough to call for help from their confusingly named friend Victor. Go ahead and change Victor Frankenstein's name to Henry if you want, even though you're essentially renaming him Hank Frankenstein, but maybe don't use his name for another character who wasn't even in the book. It's a little confusing. Victor tells Elizabeth that he'll help her get Hanky Frankie back, even though it's clear he'd be just fine taking over for Frankenstein in more than just name. I'm far too fond of you. I wish you were. Victor. Yeah, Victor, this is a proper handshake relationship only. The two of them meet with Dr. Waldman, who's got a serious skull fetish going on, and he confirms for them that his former student Henry is one seriously creepy Mother Franken, who left the university when the school refused to let him dig up dead bodies for his experiments. Whatever happened to the pursuit of knowledge, Doc? So you steal a few bodies here and there, big whoop. The body snatching Frankenstein is hard at work in his watchtower, which is equipped with cool gothic looking lab equipment and a lightning rod on the roof, cause DJ Hankenstein all about that renewable energy, yo. He's been making a man with black hair and a tan bandage wrapped around his head, and the oncoming storm is about to provide all the power they need for an evening of reanimation. Too bad that's when the doorbell ding-a-lings, cause Elizabeth, Victor, and Dr. Waldman have arrived, inadvertently just in time for the Franken festivities. Elizabeth begs Henry to come home, but he's like, nah man, I got science to do, prompting Victor to call Henry crazy. Crazy am I. We'll see whether I'm crazy or not. He takes them all upstairs and gets their individual head nods of consent before showing them his mad science laboratory and the build-a-body abomination he has beneath that blanket. Quite a good scene, isn't it? One man crazy, 
three very sane spectators. Yo, and one Fritz, Frank. Don't forget your loyal hunchback. It's finally storm o'clock, and I love how it looks like Henry and Fritz drilled for this moment countless times, because they run like clockwork, getting the body ready to frickin' ascend into the air and through the ceiling so it can be exposed to the power of the elements above. Hell yeah, dude, I love this giant laboratory set. It's even got those Tesla ball things that make your hair stand on edge. In fact, all this crazy lab equipment, designed by electrician Kenneth Strickfaden, was so awesome it was reused in movies up until the 1970s. Now that's eternal life. This storm is something fierce, giving Victor and Elizabeth an excuse to steal a snuggle, and after the body's been blasted with enough electric energy, Henry brings it back down into his lab. Wait, how's it not all wet in there with that giant hole in the ceiling? The body slowly comes to life, hand first, and we get the movie's most infamous quote from Dr. Frankenstein. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's an awesome moment by the magnificently manic Colin Clive, but he sadly had a serious drinking problem and died at the young age of 37. Co-star Mae Clark, who played Elizabeth, called him the handsomest man, but also the saddest. Interestingly, the second part of the It's Alive line proved to be pretty controversial back in 1931. In the name of God, now I know what it feels like to be God. Yeah, that part was way too blasphemous for a handful of states that would cut the line out before showing it in theaters or later on TV. The next day, Victor and Elizabeth visit Henry's dad, Baron Frankenstein, a dude who's one tiny car away from being a Shriner in the May Day Parade. Also, hope that pipe you chiefing on ain't opium, Baron, or else you about to be floating on the ceiling, dude. If he is high as balls, though, he's gonna be real excited about his next visitor. If you please, Herr Baron, the Burgermaster. What? The fucking Burgermaster? I didn't know they had delivery back then. Well, what do you want? If it's trouble, go away. I have trouble enough. Yeah, but like, what if instead of trouble, it's delicious burgers for you, bruh? Both in my private and official capacities as burgermaster. Yes, 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 we know all about that, but what do you want? Hold up, I don't know all about that. Tell me about your delicious duties, burger dude. I guess they involve throwing the wedding, which, you know, interesting catering choice. But with Henry away, playing with dead dudes all day, the wedding's an impossibility right now. And, not wanting to be further embarrassed in front of his burgery bro, Baron Frankenstein resolves to go retrieve his son and get this wedding taken care of. Dr. Waldman has stayed at Frankenstein's watchtower lab and is criticizing the mad scientist's questionable ethics. When the hangster tells him to chill, they used a grade-A brain from Waldman's very own lab, the doctor delivers the bad news. The brain that was stolen from my laboratory was a criminal brain. Frankenstein is taken aback, but still refuses to extradite the criminal brain. And speak of the abomination, here he comes. We finally get our first image of Frankenstein's monster, of course played by Boris Karloff, who apparently was cast by James Whale pretty much for his bone structure. And again, you've gotta hand it to makeup artist Jack P. Pierce for designing such an instantly iconic look for the creature. You got the prominent ridge brow, the electrode bolts in the neck, the flat top, it's great. I will mention that there is some dispute over how much influence James Whale had on the design, but by all accounts, Jack Pierce was the one who brought it to life. But you know what? Props to everyone here. The monster has already learned at least one trick, sit, and, much like a house cat, is instantly attracted to sunbeams that come through the window. Aw, does Frankie Monster have a toasty belly for me to rub? He's still pretty bad at communicating, though, having skipped all his ASL classes, and worst of all, he straight freaked the fuck out by fire. Well, we never get a classic fire bad, since the creature doesn't speak at all in this film, it's no wonder the monster's got issues when it comes to open flames, seeing as they recklessly wave it around him and tackle him to the ground while he's being a big Freddy Stein. Then what, they put him in a cell and Fritz just runs in there to randomly whip him? Dude, Fritz sucks. Leave that monster alone. Leave it alone. Yeah, listen to your master. But instead, Fritz keeps waving his torch at the creature like an asshole. So it should come as no surprise that Frankenstein and Baldman hear the hunchback screaming a minute later. <laughs> When they go to see what's happening, we see that Fritz has joined the kill count, somehow having been forcefully hanged by the creature. I love the understatement of this death. We just see the body hanging in the background of a single shot before the amazing doctorly duo has to get out of there, lest they join Herr Fritz in death. Waldman tells Frankenstein that the monster must be destroyed, and somewhat surprisingly, Frankenstein agrees to fetch a sedative so they can put the creature down. They lure him out with a torch and stick the needle in his back, and even though the monster is able to knock down both Waldman and his daddy Dr. Frankenstein, the sedative soon takes effect and causes him to pass out with some monkey noises. <laughs> That's when Victor arrives and tells the two doctors that Elizabeth and Frankenstein's father are on their way over. Damn, Henry, you've got visitors all along the watchtower. But there must be some kind of way out of here, said the Victor to the cadaver thief. And together, the three men drag the monster out of sight so the watchtower can be cleaned for company. Victor lets in Elizabeth and the Baron, who's not impressed by the watchtower's lighting layout, and when they get upstairs to where Frankenstein is washing up, he collapses on the ground in front of them. The Baron tells his son that it's time to come home, and Henry Frankenstein reluctantly acquiesces, though not without much writhing. With Frank 
Frankenstein gone, Waldman sets out to destroy the monster, making sure to chronicle the whole experience in his paper Zanga for science. But while he's journaling, Frankenstein's monster shakes off the sedative, so when Waldman goes to listen to his heartbeat or some shit, the monster slowly raises his hand behind him and grabs Waldman by the back of his neck. Seems way more like he's scruffing a cat than strangling someone to death, but it's effective enough to kill Dr. Waldman, so what the hell do I know? Also, I love that the strangling is still going on while the scene dissolves away. No shot of the corpse falling or anything? Boo! Now that he's all out of babysitters, the monster is able to flee the watchtower for a night out on the town. On the day of Henry Frankenstein's wedding, his dad gives him some family heirloom stuff and breaks out an old bottle of wine that his grandparents had originally bought. Cheers to young Frankenstein! But don't let the help have any of the good booze. Give the servants some champagne. This stuff's wasted. Yes, yes, ladies, enjoy these glasses of spittle. And then get the hell back to work. This mansion and the expensive art inside aren't going to dust themselves, you know. And looks like the bread and circus approach has also worked on the town's proletariat. It's extraordinary how friendly you can make a lot of people on a couple of bottles of beer. <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow they'll all be fighting. No, 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 no. Let me make this balcony proclamation quick. I can't stand the smell of unwashed masses. While the smelly town folk celebrate in a very shaky dolly shop, seriously, did they put down any track at all? Frankenstein's monster wanders through some foliage to find a little girl picking flowers on a lakeshore with the cutest fucking cat. Oh my god, kitty! The cat's gone by the time she walks up to the monster and introduces herself as Maria. She's not dismayed by his appearance at all and is just looking for a friend to play with. It's another iconic scene as we watch this tragically doomed friendship begin to blossom like the flowers Maria is picking. The two of them play a game where they toss flowers into the lake, but when the creature runs out of stock, he figures, hey, little girls look enough like flowers to count, so he grabs Maria. Maria lifts her up and tosses her into the water. I guess this girl never took swimming lessons at the Y, because even though they're right next to the shore, Maria never resurfaces. She drowns to death in that lake. And fun fact, the shot of Frankenstein's monster tossing her into the lake was also cut due to censorship and only rediscovered during the 1980s when it was incorporated back into the film. It's crazy that for 50 years this movie didn't have that shot in it, and that they were able to find it and put it back in. Breaking that don't see the bride early convention, Elizabeth pulls Henry into her room to tell him that Dr. Waldman still hasn't returned from from the watchtower, and that something just feels off. Something is coming between us. I know it. I know it! But Hank chalks it up to wedding day hysteria, and even after Victor comes in to tell them that Dr. Waldman was indeed found dead in the tower, Frankenstein decides that the best course of action is to just lock his bride-to-be in the bedroom for her own safety. The men all hear some monster moans and realize he must be nearby. He's upstairs! But after a quick look on the second floor, they decide they must have been wrong. It's in the cellars! How'd you mix up a sound coming from the cellar with a sound coming from upstairs? That mansion just too big for you, Hank? Turns out the monster isn't upstairs or in the cellars, he's right outside Elizabeth's room. He climbs Climbs in through the window, and even a duty brained monster can see that Elizabeth is quite a catch. <laughs> 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 Hubba hubba. He chases the future Mrs. Frankenstein around the room, and her screams are heard by Hank and Co. But too bad he locked that door, because by the time they get inside, the monster has fled and the damage is done. By which I mean Elizabeth is entirely okay, just a little shaken up. That's a real lame change from the book there, Universal. How's Frankenstein supposed to learn a lesson if the monster doesn't kill his fiance? Maybe they didn't want to kill Elizabeth after already murdering that little girl. And I guess that makes sense. The amazing shots of Maria's father carrying her limp body through the town's wedding celebration are dark as hell, and probably my favorite part of the movie. He gets a whole damn pop-up parade following him, and they rabble-rouse their way to the police station. There he tells the burgermaster what happened. She's been murdered! Really not sure how he figured that out when she could have just drowned by accident, but accidents don't get you exciting mobs, so let's just roll with it. Henry joins the mob because of the attack on Elizabeth, and the burgermaster delivers a Charles Foster Kane-like speech to kick things off. This is the most classic movie mob you've ever seen, complete with bloodhounds and torches. All we're missing are a couple of pitchforks. They march their way out of the city and split up to search all over the surrounding areas, including in the lake and through the hills. Frankenstein heads the group that goes into the mountains, where we get more very obviously fake backdrops. Damn, that shit's wrinkly. Maybe you give it a once-over with an iron before you roll camera. Henry Frankenstein stumbles upon the monster, and the two of them have one of those old-timey grapple fights. Eventually, Henry knocks himself out by running into the monster's body. That's why his nickname's The Wall, Hank. He's got a low center of gravity. Nothing can knock him over. The monster grabs Frankenstein's body and carries it up into the mountain. 
Titans, which the rest of the mob sees from afar. They chase him into a windmill on a hill, which kindly barricades itself after the monster gets inside. He drags Dr. Frankenstein up a couple of ladders in a stunt so physically demanding that Karloff wound up having to get three back surgeries throughout his life. The price of being a monster, I guess. Down below, the villagers know they're not safe until he's dead, cause he'll come stalking them at night, so they try to bust inside to kill the beast. Frankenstein finally wakes up, and after playing a game of Ring Around the Turbine with the monster, he runs out to the balcony and tries to climb down to safety. But the monster seizes him, and after another short struggle, tosses the doctor from the balcony? Holy shit! And he lands on one of the windmill blades, yes! Oh man, that was awesome. But somehow, the mad scientists survive. Again, are no lessons to be learned here, Universal? I guess not, because all that's left to do here is burn the windmill down and kill the beast inside. And with the flames growing to a monstrous size, and the creature trapped with nowhere to go, I'm gonna add him to the kill count. Yeah, I know he's in a bunch of other movies, but listen to these screams, man. <laughs> Plus, he gets trapped beneath a falling wooden beam as the fire rages around him. As far as I'm concerned, Frankenstein's monster definitely dies at the end of this movie if you take it as an individual thing, which is what I'm gonna do right now since I don't have time to cover all the sequels. Besides, don't you want to see the cute little monster icon in the numbers? I know you do. The movie ends with confirmation that Henry and Elizabeth are both alive, if still in recovery, and Baron Frankenstein toasting to his son's health once more with that wine he won't let his dirty, dirty servants drink. How many kills could a movie get away with in 1931? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Numbers good! By my count, there were five victims in Frankenstein. They included three dudes, one little girl, and one Frankenstein's monster, who, you know, was also a dude, so no extra pie wedge for him. It's fine. With a runtime of 70 minutes, we had a kill on average every 14 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Maria. Like, yeah, it's just a drowning, but they freaking killed a little girl in a movie in 1931. Most movies nowadays are too afraid to do that. Besides, it gives way to those amazing shots of her dad carrying the body through town. Doll machete for lamest kill will go to Dr. Waldman. Not even the movie could commit to the bit and show the whole kill. It just dissolves away mid-strangle. You gotta believe in yourself for me to buy in, movie. And that's it. Frankenstein came out in 1931 and has remained a permanent fixture in popular culture ever since. One day I hope to cover the other classic Universal Monster movies, but until I do, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this extra Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like J.R. Green, Michael Reeves, Dylan Fletcher, and Owen Chartran. Happy Halloween! I know Frankenstein isn't really a Halloween movie. I figured I've been wanting to do a classic monster movie. I want to give you guys something extra for Halloween. Put them together, this is what you get. Hope you enjoyed all the releases in October. Again, we're back to one a week in November. I need to sleep. Be good people!